Hello everyone and welcome back to Around the World in 80 Planes. For this flight we are going from Hamburg to Oslo in Airbus A310 and there's a freeware Airbus A310 in Lufthansa livery as you can see. Very appropriate since we're starting out in Hamburg. Um, we will have a um, Scandinavian Airlines livery for the flight between Oslo and Stockholm so there will be that. Uh, let's get some flaps in here. So there's a freeware plane. Pretty good for that. I mean, pretty good. Let's look inside again. Um, these, these, there's a dummy panel on top, though, of course. That you'll have to get a payware version for, unless it's the 737 and the whole Zebo thing. But anyway, uh, so we are going to be continuing with the Apollo 12 audio that we've been listening to for this entire series. And right now they are in between their two lunar EVAs. So, I, I forget whether they're still sleeping. They're probably still sleeping, but let's continue with the audio. Uh, Pete Conrad and Al Bean on the surface of the moon and Dick Gordon in orbit around the moon. And let's proceed. Clipper, you gave me a reading, 36.1 volts. Uh, I didn't copy for which batteries uh, were you reading that out? Yankee Clipper is where Dick Gordon is. That's the command module. Okay. Roger, and we'll be up to you with an RCS update in a minute. I guess I'll stick to this camera. An awkward camera to take off from, but all right. Okay. Yankee Clipper, Houston. I am. for the sleep period in order to get a little extra signal merging on the Omni. We'd like, first of all, uh, you'll be turning your high gain to off, S-band normal, voice to off, S-band auxiliary tape to off, and if you have to call a ground, do it on down, voice back up. So on the way to Oslo, we'll pass over Copenhagen. Copenhagen, probably. So we need to make a mild turn to the right here. Intrepid Houston, would you give us aft Intrepid Houston. First, would you give us uh, aft Omni and we're ready to pick up with the uh, debriefing? Well, there's Hamburg. I do want to continue hearing the debriefing. So they're yeah. in the middle of the debriefing for the EVA. And that's always good to listen to. Get their perspective on things in detail. Uh, uh, negative. Went above two hundred and fifty a little bit early there. Any trumpet, we're ready to pick up with the uh, deep breathing. Uh, go ahead. Okay, two questions related to the mounds which you saw out there. Is the object at R5 13.1 a mound or a rock? And secondly, uh, confirm that you did get a uh, sample of the mound material. Yes, we got a sample of the mound material. The lots of them. And would you uh, state in the coordinates? Coordinates are R5, 13.1. I don't think so. Just this mound is too small to show up. Uh, oh, 
Uh oh, uh oh. This is one of those planes that actually has pressurization. Oh no. Emergency. So it does have that function, it does have pressurization. I looked at the panel on the top and it looked deceptively non functional, but. Oop, what happened? Audio. I think that there must be a switch of tapes here. Yeah. Not seen on the map. What you gave me was a, was a crater. Roger, we copy that. And on that mound sample, you got material from the mound as well as material around the, the mound itself. That's right. We can hit it, get the Mars documented sample if you want. Uh, we'll talk to you about that uh, in the briefing before the EVAP. And a question on the uh, number and sizes of rocks. Uh, what was the ratio of fines to rocks that you finally ended up with? I put two of the large worth of fill in one bag and three rather large rocks in it. We'll probably need to be below 12,000 feet for this to clear up. A rock filled half the rock box, and I guess there were, uh, what would you say, out 10, 12 rocks in there. And uh, the rock box is full of the top. I can get anything more in there, I can tell you that. I get the first in there. That's it. Roger, we copy that. One question on the side dust cover. Uh, was the side dust cover well aligned after reclosing? And the reason for asking that is uh, in case we suspect a misalignment, we would try to activate that now. And if it doesn't work, we'd have a manual backup. Uh. The side dust cover popped off about three times, Houston. And the last time it popped off was when we just finished aligning it neatly, level, and we put out the... Uh, okay, uh, we're getting some uh, oxygen gauge. here. And so... popped off again, and uh, we didn't want to disturb the experiment to try to put the cover back on. We spent already overtime on it, so we just left the cover off. Right Usually now, the controls off. will be up here. Now, if this is not acceptable, uh, I guess we could take a swing by there tomorrow and try to put the cover back on. And we could put it on lined up accurately uh, as it was to begin with, if that's what you want. Okay, stand by on that and uh, we'll be my massaging that one tonight. Okay, my recommendation is unless it's going to hurt the side, to leave it just like it is because uh, it's just a uh, precariously balanced interesting sound in here and it, uh, it's going to take time to do it right Roger we copy that Al and uh, Pete could you uh, give us an estimate of the number of rocks you have on board well that's something that can turn on I didn't really get a count uh, just enough uh, let me see. Can't really okay, see that it's out. anything uh, important, though. We just say 15, 15 to 20 rocks is all. Okay, we're looking for uh, really the quantity of rocks, uh, pounds of rocks. That rock box is heavy, I'll tell you that. Uh, I think it's right up to max. Roger, that's good enough. One last question, Nail. When you took the fuel element out in the extraction, uh, what was the force profile? Well, like? in other words, uh, I don't see any free, indication of come free as you extracted our that? pressurization system. Well, Pete started pounding on the side, and uh, as we so we've got out, a pressurization uh, problem and no solution. I mean, on a Boeing, it'd be over here somewhere, and. But I don't see any thing that I can toggle. 
Roger, we copy that. Uh, what's the fuel cast made out of? That's so, right. we'll just stay low, I guess. Okay, well, I, I'm pretty no well problem with that. Was, uh, beginning to bag it up pretty we bad. wanted a sightsee I anyway. I, I better go look at it tomorrow. And, uh, but I was wrapping it as hard as I could, and I was getting about an eighth of an inch at a time until we finally got about a inch and a half out, and then it came all away. Roger. Uh, no problem with that. Uh, you don't have to go back to it. Okay. So we are currently approaching Oldenburg in Holstein. Holstein. Pete, we have a procedure here in order to get the water out of the suit loop. First, uh, suit loop, or the suit isolation disconnect bolt. Disconnect the O2 hoses. Suit isolation to suit flow bolt. Lower the outlet of the hose to floor. That's that floor city right minutes. there. Suit isolation to disconnect bolt. Connect both O2 hoses, suit isolation, suit flow, both. Okay, I understand that one, and we'll do it a little bit brief right now. Roger. I got my hose disconnected anyhow. Roger, Pete, and uh, we don't want to see a, a real easy way of getting the water out of the boots. Uh, if you turn the uh, heat wave way up we may be able to dry some of it out. The other thing is to use gravity in whatever way you could uh, you could use it. Use gravity. I, I don't have that much water in there and it's drying up or at least it's warm as I am right now. So it's not bothering me and uh, there's no sweat. Measure. Okay, just want to make sure the suit looks running right, that's all. Yep. Most important thing is that there's not going to be some bigger problem with the suit. Go ahead. Here's a question for you, Hughes. Uh, with a tape meter being like it is... And keep and looking around for any sort of pressurization control. Approaching a PDI as far as the uh, backup uh, fairly... That's all check. autopilot up there as usual. How are we going to use that tape meter tomorrow I don't when we try to update is. the ag range and range rate? Doesn't say anything. That's really That's suspiciously placed, though. Uh, Al, we'll be working on that one. That's another one tomorrow. We're going to have a lot of people okay, fighting hard over the sleep period. Call up now, 78. I don't feel like I can toggle yeah, it, I, though. I think we could just uh, call uh, down 78 with D20 running in there, right? Hmm. You could do that. Uh, and the uh, first thing that I'd propose doing, Houston, is we'll get a, we'll get a quick airborne check after we launch and, uh, and do a, I get a manual lock on or something, go do a firm 63 and check the tape meter against the, the uh, disc. Okay, we are departing. Okay. Well, we're not Thank quite you. departing Germany yet. We've got one more island. This Roger one right here. Uh, we recommend that, uh, you shoot for the three and a half hour EVA. But the line mass up ahead is then that de uh, Denmark, Lowland. Okay. Roger, oh, we'll wake you up at the nominal time in the flight plan. Okay. Jackie Clipper, Houston. Oh, we're going too high again. Yankee Clipper, Houston. Yankee 
Okay, so we are over Danish waters now. Welcome to Denmark. Proud owner of Greenland, of course. I mean, I know it's a uh, it's a complicated relationship. It's not owner, or, but anyway, you get the point. Well, look at all those uh, wind turbines out there. Me getting with oh we're we're definitely getting too high again. Roger, uh, that's it, Dick. Except for one thing, would you verify that your pyro bat readings are thirty six decimal one, or rather than thirty seven decimal one? They are three seven decimal one. Copy three seven decimal one. Thank you. We'll talk to you in the morning. Wish there were at least two okay. tips when I hover over things. This is Apollo Control at 121 hours 59 minutes. Uh, mission Control, we're changing shifts at this time. Flight Director. Glenn Lunny has taken over from Flight Director Jerry Griffin. Our capsule communicator is astronaut Paul Weitz. The change of shift press conference will begin shortly in the Houston News Conference. The participants are leaving mission control at this time. At 121 hours, 60 minutes, 122 hours rather, this is Mission Control Houston. This is Apollo Control at 122 hours, 57 minutes. During the change of ship briefing, we said good night to the uh, crew of Intrepid and also to Dick Gordon aboard Yankee Clipper. We last heard from uh, Yankee Clipper at about 122 hours. Uh, the CSM has now gone behind the moon and we're scheduled to reacquire in about 34 minutes. Uh, Pete Conrad came up at uh, 100. 22 hours, 15 minutes, and gave us a crew status report. He said that the crew is in super shape, that uh, Al Boone had taken one of the decongestant tablets prior to the EVA, 
And he said that uh, the crew planned to follow the um, EVA timeline for their second EVA. Uh, we requested uh, that Al Bean also uh, attempt to remove any water accumulated in his suit circuit. Al called the recommended procedure. And no, he's breaking up. A couple of small drops of water. How can the PAO be breaking up? Darn it. Uh, circuit. Uh, we said good night uh, to uh, Conrad and Bean in Intrepid at 122 hours 37 minutes. We have heard nothing from them uh, since that time. Uh, we've accumulated a total of about eight minutes of taped conversation. I don't know we'll what that bay that is. For you now and then continue to stand by live. <laughs> Well, this little uh, area right here poking out. Hold on. This is apparently a fjord. Avno fjord. Just in case you thought that fjord has only happened in Norway. First off, what are your intentions for your pseudo's configuration for sleep? Over. Apparently that uh, bay there is also called Fjord, uh, Dibso Fjord. I don't know how to do the O with the slash in the middle of it. Secondly, how about for our friendly surgeon, a crew status report and a medication and radiation status. I'm also willfully assuming that the J is pronounced as a Y in this case. And let me look at my little red center here a second. Uh, LMP had one of those decongestant pills uh, just by the EVA. Understand, Al. And my red counter is what? My red counter is... So they're replaying the crew stats report before they went to sleep. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question on your... Uh, did you have any problems... Gravity with gear. During your descent Wonder what that is. High on the Paraloon check? Hmm. We had an altitude, altitude rate, uh, altered descent, actually, and it looked to me like it agreed pretty closely with the pink uh, numerical readout on the disk. That's what that concerns me about the rendezvous radar. All A line between... Uh, maybe they're all hooked in somehow. Or seen recaptured okay, in one season and another, yeah, unfortunately. I disagree. I disagree on low transmitter power. Uh, yeah, we got... Uh, we got the surface locked up and uh, when the command module went by the good P-22, uh, the tape meter did not run in the P-22 like it does in the simulator, I'll say that's what, and secondly, it was off, I don't remember the number now, but it was off from its normal reading and self-test, although the pink portion of Rod Blue Radar self-test was absolutely correct. So I suspect that there may be just something wrong with that tape meter. I don't think there's anything wrong with the rendezvous radar itself. Okay, thank you. And uh, it was just uh, that it was not in agreement. Uh, it was not erratic in operation in any way, was it? No, it runs just perfect. It's not erratic. Anchor just, my impression on these parallel altitude checks, I think there may be a bias on it. Like, uh, 30 or 40 feet per second. That's a lot of bias. Intrepid, thank you. Intrepid, Houston, uh, feet the second time you disconnected your suit hoses. Did you get any water out of the hoses then? Uh, uh, it was the second time that I got all the water out of them. Uh, I, did, I, I took them off the first time, put them on the floor as advertised, they didn't get water out of them. I put it back on again, I started getting water in my boots, but I took them off that side, and I never put them on the floor. I just took them off, and it blew three, three-quarter inch water balls right out of it, and it splattered all over the spacecraft. And since then, it's been pretty good. And we turned the uh, suit uh, dealie here up so hot, and uh, we'll see, uh, see how that works. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Intrepid Houston has has Al done the same thing with his hoses feet and uh, if he has not we would uh, like to request that he do so before you turn in yeah he, he, he hasn't gotten any water but he's going to drain them right now now look uh, that is down here for an hour at East of Mars. Uh, we're in 160, and when it doesn't take us anywhere... Well, this is looking pleasant. We can whistle through things a lot faster. I think we can pretty well stick to the nominal timeline and get a good night's nice rest. It may turn out that after six or seven hours worth of sleep, we're going to get stirring because we're both up. And we're not going to sit here. So uh, we'll give you a holler whenever we get up, and we're going to start cooking right then and there and be ready to go over the sill. At that, so that we can get as good an EVA out of it as possible and not cut ourselves at the end. Okay, I'll be fine, see? So, this is the town of Koga. Intrepid Houston uh, requested Al go to uh, Koga, probably something like that. Uh, if there is any water in there, it'll flow it on out. That's a pretty reasonable request. And we can see Copenhagen up ahead. Pretty distinctive land feature. Go ahead. Hey, uh, Pete, can we have the results of uh, Al's Suzuki check? Thank you. You got two drops of water. That's it. Two drops of water. Okay, I understand. And uh, on that lithium mine. I don't have any uh, water time to speak of. These guys are coming out all the time. Let's just hope a separator, but I really don't have to get. Oh, he's breaking up. I can't hear. Nope, he's really breaking up. Oh, well. Roger, I'll understand. And also, I don't know how he understood that, but okay. If it fits in with your activities at that time, we would like to have it changed out at uh, 130 hours on the clock. And for your information, you're 12 minutes past the halfway mark in your uh, total mission time. Roger. Uh, and, and you want the LIOH out at 130.00. That's affirmative. <laughs> okay, good show. Al wanted to go out again immediately. So we're just going to fly over Copenhagen and then move on to Oslo. I don't know, I see some problematic scenery over there. Last time I made this flight, Norway did not want to render. And I don't know why, but hopefully it will not have the same problem again. There was no problem taking off from uh, Oslo. Just didn't want to render when we came from this direction. Well, you can see what makes Copenhagen a very good harbor. <laughs> Quite a good harbor. This is Paul of Control. That brings us up to date with the taped conversation. We'll continue to stand by live now. And the airport is over to the right there. Four minutes until reacquiring. 
contact Gordon in the command module. And it's been about uh, 30 minutes since we said goodnight to the crew of Intrepid on the lunar surface. During that uh, taped conversation, you heard Pete Conrad advise that... Uh, okay, we have they to make a turn to no the left. ...staying with the EVA uh, timeline for the second EVA. We also it a clear implication that uh, if the crew is up and awake somewhat earlier than the scheduled wake-up time of 129 hours, 55 minutes, that they would plan to press ahead with the EVA. Yeah, there's obviously a bad patch there. Activity. Looks like the coastline is okay. Uh, won't have any further information on that until we see what time the crew gets up after their sleep period, and uh, until we see how well they're staying with the uh, timeline and preparing for the EVA. At 123 hours nine minutes, this is a follow control, Houston. This is Apollo Control at 124 hours, one minute. It's been about uh, one and a half hours now since we said goodnight to the crew of Intrepid. So there'll probably be just a whole bunch of PAO Alpine. comments for and the night time. two hours since we last heard from Dick Gordon aboard uh, Yankee Clipper. Mission Control, we've been monitoring systems on both spacecraft. Uh, everything continues to look normal. Flight Director Glenn Lunny has been reviewing the status of the extravehicular mobility unit for the upcoming second EVA. We'll continue to leave the air to ground tickets up live if we have any confirmation from the spacecraft. The scheduled wake up time. I'll try and avoid the bad patch. Hours, Hopefully it doesn't extend, in, extend into Pete Conrad where we want to go. Beginning the rest period that uh, if he and Al Bean were awake earlier than the scheduled wake up time, they would expect to get up and get going, uh, working toward their EVA. At 124 hours, two minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Still technically over Danish waters. Uh, city to our right is Helsingborg in Sweden. This is Apollo Control at 125 hours, 3 minutes. The uh, sleep period is scheduled to end uh, about 5 hours from now. now the uh, command module, Yankee Clipper, has been behind the moon now for some 20 minutes. We're scheduled to reacquire uh, in about 26 minutes from now. The last look we had uh, at the command and service module before it went behind the moon, everything looked good. Uh, we last heard from Dick Gordon aboard the spacecraft at about 122 hours. Sort of washed out textures up ahead. His rest period. And we last heard from Pete Conrad and Al Bean we are now Trumpet over Sweden. At uh, 122 hours 37 minutes. So bye bye Denmark. Scheduled to wake up at uh, 129 hours 55 minutes. We'll continue to leave the uh, air to ground circuits open uh, throughout this sleep period. Uh, should we get any uh, conversation from the crew? In mission control, it uh, has settled down very quiet period. Uh, we've completed uh, reviews of the portable life support system status and uh, activity now is uh, involved primarily with keeping an eye on the spacecraft systems. At 125 hours five minutes this is Apollo Control Houston. This is Apollo Control at 126 hours. Uh, we have some four hours left in the rest period for both the uh, Intrepid crew and for Dick Gordon aboard the uh, CSM Yankee Clipper. 
The uh, sleep period is scheduled to end at 129 hours, 55 minutes. We have about uh, 41 minutes of acquisition left uh, on Yankee Clipper, the command module now in its 22nd revolution of the moon. Uh, as the spacecraft came around to the front side, the uh, ECOM engineer reported that all systems look good on the uh, CSM. Of course, we've been monitoring systems on the LEM continuously since the landing, and all systems there uh, look nominal at this time. The preliminary coordinates on the landing site are three degrees, two minutes, 10 seconds south, 23 degrees, 25 minutes, five seconds huh? west. We're getting or some hesitation here for some reason. I guess it loaded something. Degrees uh, south and 23.418 degrees west. That's a nice little peninsula there. there there's a park there. Yeah, this is a preliminary figure, and we expect that there would be some refinement to that, uh, particularly after the data is uh, gathered during the liftoff. Kulaberg. Works back into the assessment of the landing site. At 126 hours, two minutes, this is Apollo Control Houston continuing to stand by. Ugh. Yeah, it's just a square area. There seems to be a good patch in the middle of that square, but obviously a single square, that's problematic right there. But this is Apollo Control our forward path is clear. Hours, nine minutes. We have about 19 minutes uh, before we reacquire the command module, Yankee Clipper, on its 23rd revolution of the moon. The flight surgeon uh, reports that all three crewmen are sleeping at this time. We have about uh, a little over two hours, 45 minutes left in the uh, sleep period. That uh, sleep period is scheduled to end at 129 hours, 55 minutes. Uh, prior to beginning the rest period, at about 122 hours, 37 minutes, uh, Pete Conrad advised us that uh, should he and Al Bean wake up prior to the uh, scheduled wake-up time, they would begin preparations for yeah, extra We're getting a little bit low here. And would, uh, as he put it, go over the sill as if they're ready. The current uh, orbital parameters for the uh, command module, Yankee Clipper, 61.8 nautical miles for the uh, Apolloon, 58.7 nautical miles for Paraloon. The orbital period is 1 hour, 58 minutes, 50 seconds. The uh, flight dynamics officer reports that the plane change maneuver. Pretty clear on day. Real world Yankee weather Clipper is on. At, uh, so we've got real time weather. 47 minutes and 12 seconds. Uh, was nominal. Uh, the maneuver was targeted to move the ground track of the uh, command module 3.8 degrees north of the present of uh, its previous ground track at the point it crosses lunar landing site number seven. This is to put the command module in plane with the lunar module at the time of liftoff. We're now 17 minutes from reacquiring uh, Yankee Clipper, continuing to monitor systems on the lunar module. Everything continuing to look good at this time. At 127 hours, 11 minutes, this is Apollo Control Houston. This is Apollo Control at 128 hours, six minutes. Uh, we're now somewhat less than two hours away from the scheduled end of this sleep period. Uh, the command module Yankee Clipper uh, will shortly be passing over landing site seven and uh, Intrepid. Have about 34 minutes of acquisition left with the command module on the path. 
contact the Clipper now on its 23rd revolution of the moon. We've had no conversations with any of the crewmen uh, on either spacecraft since uh, they began their sleep period. Uh, Dick Gordon we last heard from at about 122 hours. And uh, we heard last from Pete Conrad, boarding Kremlin at about 122 hours and 37 minutes. On a couple of occasions during the sleep period, uh, the LEM environmental systems engineers reported uh, telemetry indications that uh, Al Dean was making uh, minor adjustments to his uh, suit circuit, uh, probably for temperature control. In one case, uh, uh, raising the temperature and uh, in the other, uh, reducing it slightly. Other Town to our and, uh, right is no Falkenberg. From the spacecraft to no communications. And uh, biomedical data on Pete Conrad indicates that uh, he is sleeping soundly. We also have a uh, minor update to the coordinates for the Intrepid landing site uh, based on Pete Conrad's description of uh, where he thought the spacecraft had touched down. The uh, new coordinates that we have for the LEM are 3.036 degrees south, and that figure shows no change from the previous one, and 23.416 degrees west, which is uh, change from the previous 23.418. The new figure again, 23.416 degrees west. Uh, using the same coordinate system for the surveyor spacecraft, we have it at 3.04 degrees south and 23.411. We want to follow west. the coast a little bit better. We can go directly over the coast now that that bad patch is gone. It's back there. Let's get over the coast so we can see things a little bit better. At 128 hours, 9 minutes into the flight of Apollo 12, this is Mission Control of Houston. Better keep an eye on the fuel because I wasn't planning on... Uh, oh, it's alright. I wasn't planning on flying at 12,000 feet. But yeah, that doesn't look too bad. I carry like double what I needed anyway. Hours, 51 minutes. Uh, we're still about one hour from the scheduled end of the uh, sleep period. However, the uh, flight surgeon reports uh, some indications in the biomedical data that uh, the crew may be beginning to stir. Uh, so we'll be standing by live for any uh, call from the spacecraft. The uh, sleep period began for uh, Dick Gordon in the command module, Yankee Clipper, at about 122 hours. Uh, we heard from Pete Conrad uh, aboard the LEM about 37 minutes after we last heard from Yankee Clipper, or at about 122.37, ground to last time. And uh, Conrad advised us at that time that uh, if he and Al Bean were awake and uh, this is Varberg to early, they would begin preparation to our forward right scheduled for their extravehicular activity. Varberg, everyone. Currently showing the command module in an orbit uh, with an apolloon of 61.8 nautical miles, a paraloon of 58.7. Uh, the last figure we had on an orbital period for the command module was 1 hour, 58 minutes, 50 seconds. And we'll be reacquiring Yankee Clipper in about 33 minutes and 30 seconds from now. 128 hours, 53 minutes. This is Apollo Control standing by. Okay, that's a bit better. How are you this morning? Ah, uh, wake up calls. 
Good morning, Intrepid. How did you sleep? Short but sweet. We're uh, hustling right now. And uh, we're going to eat breakfast, have a little talk with you, and get about our business. Sounds good. Always like the fiddly coastlines. It's uh, 1925 now, Al. Okay, Houston, uh, we both slept five hours. My uh, PRD is 11020, and Al's is. 04021. Raj, copy, Intrepid. Uh, for information, uh, Pete, can you see the LSEP out the limb window? Sure can. Okay, uh, when you get a chance, what I'd like you to do is they are, are getting, not getting the readings they expected from the CCIG. If you can, we'd like you to uh, give a look-see at it with a monocular to see whether you can tell whether it is right side up and whether the port has been opened or not, over. Okay, wait one. We left that in a rather precarious position due to that cable last night, uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if it's not upside down, face down, because that's exactly where I wanted to go. Yeah, I understand, Pete. Uh, it's, uh, they've given a the command to open the ports and the pressure is not going down in it at the rate they expected. I mean, I know uh, technically fjords are supposed to have high cliffs, but this is called Kungsbacka well, Fjorden. This we bay here. May Fjorden does not include the high cliffs, so I don't know. Uh, town to our forward left is Ansala. Town in front of us is Kumsbaka, which uh, Fjorden is apparently named in conjunction with. Houston is on the opposite side of the side, and, uh, and uh, which is mostly lined up with my. It does look like it's. I can't tell. Have luck. Okay, thank you, Pete. Still over Sweden here, of course. You can see a little bit of Denmark sticking out there over to the left. Okay, intrepid Houston. That's I an island. A, a late change for you that came in a couple hours ago. On the rocks you were bringing back in the jettison bag. Grumman has come through and uh, along the way and uh, several people have decided that uh, the weight, the allowable weight to be stowed in the bags on the deck there should be reduced from 35 pounds to 20 pounds. No, oh, I see a bad block up ahead. Maybe that's just a cloud layer thing. Bag. This city in front of us is Gothenburg. Gothenburg. Houston, while you're working that problem. Okay, yeah, that was just clouds. Uh, I'd like to know if there are any restrictions on when we go over the sill. Okay, stand by, Pete. We'll give you the word on that. Okay, I'd like to go as soon as I can get ready without hurrying. And I kind of got the suspicion looking over the prep card. A good bit of this stuff is done. And it's 
pretty much a deal of hooking up the pluses and going. And I think we're going to be able to uh, get out somewhere around 131.30 to 132. Let me look at the timeline and see what that says we should be doing then normally. Roger, Trepid. Okay, Intrepid, Houston, uh, that's uh, affirmative, Pete. Whenever you're ready uh, at your own pace, uh, you can go over this hill. Uh, of course, we do want to talk to you about the uh, briefing on the Traverse before you go out. Okay, I'll give you a call in about uh, three, four minutes. We got some Nice sport to do. city, this one. And while we're eating breakfast, you can uh, give us the uh, hot word on geology. Also, give us some word on uh, the families, if you would. Okay, sure will. Uh, did you get that on the, uh, the allowable weight of materials to be brought back in the jettison bags being changed from 35 pounds to 20 pounds? Roger, how far down on the scale is that? Uh, I can't remember. That's one inch, Pete. One inch, Roger. Lots of very nice little islands out there. Everybody gets an island. <laughs> well, Intrepid Houston. Could be possible. Uh, the TV camera brought back, so I've got some changes to your service Depending on how small uh, a patch of dirt you consider an island. For return when you're ready to copy. But they are distinctly unequal islands, though. So, there would okay, be conflict. Page. Okay, page 65 to start with. There, go ahead. Okay, down uh, under the block that contains the work Maybe. rest period. Uh, okay, who was talking there? Fourth <laughs> item down is voice to voice. That person should not have been talking. We want to insert in there a step to stow utility towels from the hammocks in the upper boot box. These will be used, uh, as I'll describe to you later, to protect the TV camera when you stow it for return. I, I, I actually think that was the flight director accident we Chuck, caught we there. We already took a to use to keep ourselves nice and clean. Okay. Okay, now on page uh, 67 of the surface checklist. Go. Okay, on the uh, right-hand column under EVEA 2 prep about the 8th or 9th uh, line down it says remove ECS lithium hydroxide cartridge and bracket do not remove the bracket keep it on the engine cover over good idea very okay, nice landscape on page uh, 77 very pleasing overall Not, you know, a continuous Go. huge swath okay, of right farmland. Under LMP, next to the last step after verified Very dynamic. Breaker, insert a step to open the TV circuit breaker. Okay, here's... In other words, you're saying turn the TV on to begin with, and then uh, before I get out to open it, is that the plan? Uh, that's affirmative, Al. I should have made that clear. Uh, they want to try one more look to see if uh, something short of a miracle occurred, and then you will open the circuit breaker again before you get out. Sounds good. Be sure to remind me, because it's not on my cut checklist. I won't have this one out. And uh, what's the latest thinking on that, too? Uh mean on why it didn't work out? That's right. That hadn't been resolved yet. Dan, I worry about that one all night. Okay, don't sweat it. Uh, on page 78 now. Go. Okay, under the uh, CDR, now we're going to have you uh, use your uh, 
surveyor dismantling tool, I guess, on this uh, TV camera, the cutters, to get it apart. So we'll add a couple steps. They've got to do TV here, surgery. Of your list. We want you to cut the TV cable on the spacecraft side of the camera connector below, below the adapter. And then stow the TV. Yeah, I understand. And then stow the TV camera in the ETB. Oh, okay. That's simpler than I thought they were going to okay. ask him to okay. do. Okay, we'll remind you of these steps since they're not on your chart. Also mentioned. That's right, because they're not on the cuff. Right. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Okay, now on page 93. Well, because we were confined to a lower altitude, this flight took longer than I expected. Go ahead. Should have just okay, been an hour right at most. The fourth or fifth line up after unstow 70 millimeter camera. It'll go a little bit longer. Add the step to unstow the TV camera from the ETB. We're not too far away though. Cover. Probably 20 minutes. Okay, next step. Okay, okay. It, it's been written uh, on page 97, Pete. Go ahead. Okay, let me, let me read it over here a minute and I'll paraphrase it for you. We want to fold the TV camera. We're going to stow it in the lithium hydroxide canister. Okay, and you want us to pack it with the uh, towels as best we can, huh? That's affirmative, and uh, they want it to just wrap the remaining cable, fold the handle, wrap the cable around the camera as best you can, and stow it in the lithium hydroxide canister bracket on the engine cover, and stow it with the lens up. Over. Okay, now, uh, has anybody checked to make sure that we can fit the camera and all the cables and stuff in that city? That's, that's affirmative they had, and, uh... Whoop. Okay. Okay, the only reason I wondered is, in case it... We'll make it work. Raj, the lens will stick up. It's been checked out. The lens will protrude up out of the, uh... A canister stowage uh, about six, seven inches, and they then want you to uh, wrap some utility okay, wraps I'm around the uh, end of the camera to hold it in place. Well done. Consider it done, Brad. Okay, and, and one other thing on your tie down of this bag with the extra rocks in it. They want you to run an additional strap. Stand by one. Every little detail, they have to go through every little detail. Okay, after you get the bag secured uh, on the deck there between you, they want an additional strap run from the straps holding the bag down up to the ISA D-ring for additional support, over. Okay, we'll do it. Okay, that takes care of our procedural changes this morning. I'll uh, give your families a call, get the word back up to you in about five or 10 minutes. Sounds good. What's the Yankee Clipper doing, sleeping? Yeah, he's uh, cutting off a few Z's there. <laughs> Very, very glacial landscape we have Clipper here. We're scheduled to sleep till 1.30, 1.30, and our intention now is to let him sleep till then, uh, if he does. Suddenly, no more clouds? I was almost okay. enjoying those clouds. Uh-oh, okay, we've got, got some bad scenery. That here, that beige the, patch uh, there is the questionable. Crew of the USS Independent Hopefully that's just in the water. Of 
the USS Intrepid extend their best wishes to all three of you. They're following your progress closely as you write another intrepid chapter in American history. And they, from the Blue Caribbean, they wish you smooth sailing on your voyage across the vast ocean of space. Their thoughts and prayers are with you. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. I think that's just in the water, but we'll want to get that fixed for later flights. Uh, oh, we need to go down the, a bit. Uh, computer uh, out of uh, PO6 and put it back to bed again. I wanted Stand to see by. how much fuel we had in case we needed to divert. Oh, we got tons. Okay, uh, Houston, I got another one of those 1105 alarms, which is up like too fast. I don't know why that happens all the time. But it does. I'm going to go ahead and put it back to sleep again. Most logical diversion fine, would be straight on to Stockholm and we'll add another leg in the middle somewhere. Okay, it's back in standby. Probably Roger. close to Singapore or add a leg to Jakarta or something. If we had to this cut out Oslo for some reason. Hours, have a oh no, it's looking you, better now. Okay, go ahead with the consumables update and then the block data. Alright, RCS Alpha is 80%. Bravo is 76. Oxygen is 76 and 9 or 6. Water, 47 and 9 or 9 or. And your amp hours is 850 and 572. The liftoff block data for Rev 25, which is T13, is 131135. Okay, now the clouds are just Rev being annoying, to be honest. T14 is 134095. Rev 27. T15 136 0825 Rev 28 T16 is 138 Over. We are approaching the Norway Sweden border. Got like uh, one last little town here called Stromstra uh, Stromstad. Not this one, it'll be to our left. That's affirmative, Al. I don't know if we'll see it behind the clouds. Hello, oh, Intrepid Houston. I have a couple words on your rendezvous radar self-test and your tape meter if you're interested in them now. Go up. Okay, your uh, rendezvous radar self-test was good. The checklist uh, had the spec values, not the actual values, which is a reason for the difference. They ran through them on the ground and it checked out 4-0. Your tape meter paraloon checks were also good. MPAD ran a solution through on the ground here using the actual CSM state vectors. They had been slightly perturbed, and they came up with the same... Yeah, we can't really see this Stromstad. It's under this cloud at our right wing. How about that? Very fluffy cloud, though. Okay, then you think uh, our tape meter is going to be accurate nope. during the rendezvous, then we could just use that data. That's affirmative. Okay, 
Okay, he'll be with you in a minute, uh, Pete. Okay. Okay, basically at the border Pete now. Pete Houston, we're ready to go with the Trapper's plan. Ho, 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 good morning. Good morning, good morning. We can uh, pick it up on uh, LSE 76G. Uh, and we are over that's Norway. Way to follow it on your map. Have it right by hand, go. Not that it's particularly okay, clear right now. All, the, the two prime sites we consider on here are Bench and Sharp Craters. We could pretty much uh, follow the Travers, which we discussed before. What I'd like to do is to give you the additional information that you don't have on your sheet, and also perhaps to discuss how we'll fit the LSEP uh, revisit into this. Your first point along the Traverse is Head Crater, and which we call out F. What we'd like to do in, in view of the fact that you're going over towards the LSEP is to move that site over to the northwest rim of Head Crater. And the coordinates there are R011.0. And then you will carry out what we already have uh, outlined for Head Crater. That's the two partial pans across Head Crater and uh, document the slumps, slumps and ledges. In addition to that... I guess I might as well try and get the below these so clouds. We'll to that. slow down here. We'd like to see if we can get a known signal for the PSE. So if you, if possible, could you roll a large crater, or a large boulder... Uh, roll a large a crater. Roll a large rock into the crater and take a stereo pair of the rock rolling. Could be good. Take a uh, stereo pair of the rock prior to rolling and a stereo pair of the track made by the rock after rolling. Okay, that's uh, that's point one. You copy? Yes, sir. We'll rock and roll. <laughs> hey, you knew he'd have some sort of comment for that. Oh, well, too fast, too fast. Rod, right, we've got some uh, some happy-looking geologists here. We have. Uh, <laughs> old Clanton back here, and uh, he's betting that uh, somewhere along the Traverse you'll find some stuff. I think there's stuff all over the place. Okay, after this first point, then you can uh, go on out to LSEP, and uh, word on the CCIG is to make sure that it is laying on its back. We first uh, would like you to confirm, however, that you did try to lay it down in the normal mode and that uh, the only way you really can, uh, you thought you could make it work is uh, having it lay on its back. Yeah, look, we're gonna go the other way around, I think. Let's go to Alsap and then to one. That's the head crater. Okay, fine. Either way you want. Uh, uh, those look like genuinely bad look, patches you know, right there. Thing while you're standing there. Yep. I, I want, I, I want to tell you, that train will have to be picked up again. From the window. Uh, sharp crater, I do not. Uh, so, it looks to me like it would be relatively easy to go to Alsap to the uh, coordinates you gave me on head crater. And I uh, am looking at it right now and I see several yep. rocks which uh, might... <laughs> Do what you want to do the whole you coastline the here, the, the whole bay leading up into Oslo's and, uh, got problems. By what astronaut, probably. Interesting. But anyhow, we'll, we'll give that a whirl. And then, is the next point you want it to go sharp? And if so, just let's press. No, Pete, the uh, next one is Bench Crater. And then we'll be moving on to Sharp. Okay. What we'd like to do is to move... Like to uh, do it the other way around, that way I'm going around in a circle. Okay, what we wanted to do was to move your point B on Bench Crater on over to the uh, northwest edge of that, as opposed to uh, on the uh, southwestern edge. 
Okay, I'm with you. Give me the coordinates and we'll do it your way. Okay, coordinates on that would be uh, M0. Nope. Audio, what happened? So you'd be up on the north side of it. Great minds think alike. That's where I was poised. Okay. Roger. Okay, the three, uh, three things we'd like you to do there, which are are in addition to what we've already discussed on your plan. Take stereo pairs of the features I of interest in the bench I think it's fixed up ahead, hopefully. Hopefully it's not messing up Oslo. Or Brecha near the base of the regular. And if the bench is bedrock, sample the ejector representative of the bench, or sample the bench itself, if possible. And lastly, uh, look northwest and... Understand. Roger, Al. And lastly, in Bench Crater, look northwest and southwest from the rim of Bench Crater to see if uh, Copernican ray material is obviously different from other units. Okay. Okay, moving on to uh, Sharp Crater, which is uh, coordinate A. First, um, you call, we call out for a full trench site sample in the crest of Sharp Crater. And we want to make sure you also add to that the uh, gas analysis sample. That looks as though it'll be uh, pretty much your furthest point out. And we'd like a uh, full pan from the rim of Sharp Crater. That uh, also is because it's your furthest point out. And crew, uh, crew option at this point, extend your traverse west into uh, what appears to be Copernican ray material. And uh, also, hold on just a second. Okay. No, there's still some bad patches in the middle of the water there. Okay, great. Oh, actually, that's okay, on the other uh, side of the water, maybe. On Sharp Crater is a sample and described Tough to tell. across the contact of M1, M2. There's a lot of water uh, around. No, that's in the middle of the water. On your map, that shows up as a dotted line running uh, northwest, uh, southeast. Yeah, we, we, we've got it. I can tell you right now, it's going to be pretty darn hard to do that. Uh, looking cross sun, the material looks all the same. <coughs> looking down sun, it looks all the same, just a different color. You want me to get some more it's frame? Running, yeah, well, that didn't help at all. Sure okay, we get it. Far out, but down here it might as well all be the same. Guess it's just right loading up something up. An individual rock. Loading Roger, Oslo. Understand, uh, probably you might not see any color differences, but if you could keep your eye open for uh, differences in rock types. Moving on to uh, the fourth point, we will. which is Halo Crater. Halo uh, Crater. We have a call out there. At this point, you can try Still to join stuttery the two core because it's loading something. And core through the uh, thin. Ejecta of Crater 6 or Ouch. Halo Crater. Uh, when you do that, you pull, you'll you have to pull the pit pin off the uh, one core tube, which you make the bottom tube. We'd like you to avoid the rocky yeah, parts of the crater. That's not helping at all. And if the tubes can't be joined, just take one on well, the rim and then one about uh, 100 <laughs> that's feet cheating. west of that location. If you could, uh, give us a pan at that location. Well, we're going and down. That's not there good. There is a uh, comment which is uh, really applicable to all of the Traverse. Document pattern ground and fillets on different slopes and blocks, uh, especially any asymmetric fillets you may run into. We would expect, uh, or we find it most interesting to get this type of information on the youngest material, so that's where we call for it here, especially in Halo Crater. Uh, the best way to document pattern ground is to photo into the sun near field. And that way the, uh, the pattern should show up uh, in an optimum way. Uh, more okay. clouds. Oh, suddenly not so and much. Our last one is, uh, you go on down to Boy, we are a big shadow on the ground. Then uh, in there we have a block crater. We like there to uh, collect the samples of major rock types and a partial pan across the severe crater. Well, things are looking a little bit and better as we approach Oslo. 
Hopefully it's not fooling with us. Okay, we may have a little trouble Ooh, getting wobbly. the crater. I'm not sure whether it's an optical illusion or, or what, but that face, that wall that the surveyor's on looks one way on a lot deeper than uh, 14 degrees. Now, it just may be that we're standing on the other side of the crater ourselves, and it just looks a little funny, and we've been discussing the surveyor a little bit here during the evening. 14 degrees is and, still uh, reasonably, uh, well, then again, one-sixth gravity and all. It's pretty uh, rugged over on that side, especially at the block area, as I remember it from yesterday. But we'll give her a go. Now, when we get to each one of these points, you can remind us of it again. But I, I think we have it fairly well in mind what you want. Okay, we'll be talking to you on the way. And uh, one last note of clarification on that CCIG. If it's uh, sitting up so that... Uh, it's pointing horizontal to the ground, uh, just leave it alone. If it's flipped over so that it's uh, looking into the ground, then uh, we want you to uh, lay it on its back. And if it's already on its back, uh, that's good enough. Okay, uh, now the cover should be off, is that right? That's affirmative. If it's not off, try and take it off for you. Stand by. Pete, uh, that's negative. If it's uh, on there, uh, leave it as it is. Understand. So we're following the E6 up to Oslo. And we're coming close now. This is Apollo Control at 129 hours, 52 minutes. Uh, we're presently in the midst of a shift change in mission control. Uh, Flight Director Jerry Griffin coming on to replace uh, Flight Director Glenn Lunny. The capsule communicator on this shift will be astronaut uh, Ed Gibson. We plan to have a change of shift briefing. Uh, Let's at take a look. 8.30 Central Standard Time. Houston We're Center. wanting to land at ENGM. Uh, we Enigma. No, uh, we could fly straight in. We have about uh, 46 minutes remaining uh, before we lose contact with the command module. And we plan to continue to allow uh, Dick Gordon to uh, sleep. Pete Conrad advised that uh, the crew will press ahead with preparations for their extravehicular activity, uh, beginning that uh, activity as early as 131.30 ground elapsed time, or uh, well, actually between 131.30 and 132. And this would be uh, anywhere from an hour and a half, from an hour to an hour and a half ahead of schedule. We will also Oslo is sort of a raid on the northern coast of uh, on, uh, a lake or a sea, any, uh, depending on how you look at it. Unexpected change in the status. And if, uh, if Technically, a it's uh, Bunafjorden. Uh, picture. So okay, whatever that translates to. Picture the uh, crew has been instructed to turn the circuit breaker off. That's what we're over right now. Uh, and that's EVA. Oslo in front of us clip the cables on the camera and uh, bring it back with them. At 129 hours, 54 minutes, this is Apollo Control. Just that uh, one quick, you want a core stupid head crater or you want us to skip that one? Stand by. So, welcome to Oslo. I don't have any particularly special scenery here, though there seem to be some buildings over there. Okay, uh, Maybe on the way to Stockholm, I'll fly over it. Because that's a shorter flight. In, the, uh, in doing your trench site sampling, that will uh, allow you to get that biological core tube sample at that point. Understand.
Intrepid Houston, uh, we're having a changeover of sites here, and we may be off the line for a short while. Thank you, Houston. That's a good way to do it. It'll be in about another three minutes we're handing over. Okay. All right, where is this airport? Intrepid Houston, go ahead. And a really interesting thing has happened to that solar wind collector. Uh, it's been sent out there since yesterday, of course. And when I left it yesterday, it was uh, just a flat sheet of foil, you know, restrained at both ends. But as I look out there now, uh, starting about one, uh, maybe a foot from the top, it uh, it sort of folded back around the pole that's holding it. It looks almost like a uh, sail in the wind around the pole. It started bulging in the front and being bent back on the side. It's so crazy. We've got a, uh, yeah, a fairly we'll strong solar that. wind, I suspect, Dale. A strong solar uh, wind. I, uh, you may think you're kidding. I don't know. <laughs> no, Al, uh, I wouldn't think you'd be kidding. It could be, um, maybe the front part of that is just uh, thermally expanding a lot more than the back. The back's probably radiating and the front's probably very hot. And uh, just the thermal uh, difference across it could do it. I'm meeting with a lot of approval back here on that it's idea. Actually wrapped, it looks, yeah, well, it looks like it's wrapped around the pole like the plane A. It looks like wind blowing on it. God, I'm sure conspiracy well, theorists we would uh, so far. Maybe we can come up with third. have a field day with that. Okay, well, we're slow enough to drop that. This is Apollo Control at 130 hours 26 minutes. Alright. I still can't see the, the airfield. Participants in the change of ship. Let's this get to the cockpit, though. Have left the Mission Control Center and are en route to the Houston News Center, where the news conference will begin shortly. Well, that's a daunting sort of angle right there. On this little radar thing, we've got like a straight track going like that, so... Intrepid Houston, go ahead. That seems to be the right idea. Right, the LIOH canister was changed out at uh, 130.000. EVA prep is uh, almost complete to uh, Plistonic. Uh, we're just uh, putting the... Uh, they sure put the airport pretty far out. Roger, Pete, we copy. Excuse me, material. Copy. Yep. Very far out. There were other little airfields closer in. I guess those might be domestic. This is Apollo Control at 130 hours 35 minutes. The news conference is ready to begin and we'll take down the release line during the conference. Okay, uh, I guess we're ready to begin this. Oh, uh, they actually have a news conference. On the ship, Glenn Lunny. I don't know how much of it they the PAO recorded though. As usual, and we'll uh, follow that with questions. I would have brought some more people over with me tonight uh, in areas that I'm sure you're interested in, but right now everybody's fairly busy. We expect uh, that we will depress the cabin within an hour to an hour and a half from okay, now. Okay, I think I see the airport. That time may be off a few minutes either way. We came on duty this yeah, morning. Yeah, we're pretty low, uh, that's why. This afternoon. It's tough. And I uh, understand Jerry had, Jerry Griffin had a briefing on the first EVA. Well, essentially, we were on during a period when there was, uh, when the pilots were sleeping and there was not much activity, but just briefly, we went over all the uh, the briefing comments on the first EVA, uh, checked the uh, PLIS consumables, the backpack consumables, uh, with the water weights that the uh, pilots uh, passed to us after the first EVA. And we also had some discussion about water in the suit hoses, uh, 
we don't know any more about that today than I believe was reported to you by Jerry this afternoon. There, there is some water. Apparently in the commander's hoses, it's, it's a theory that uh, perhaps the length of hoses is just allowing the water to, the hose to droop a little bit and water to uh, settle out more than it does in the shorter hose on the LMP and that the cold uh, liquid, uh, the water which is in a tube uh, around that uh, oxygen hose is causing any water or moist air to condense in the suit. So we don't have any more of a explanation than that theory at this time. However, the pilot slept well. Pete did not complain about it uh, since he woke oh, okay. up, and uh, we're not anticipating that Things it's going to give us a problem that uh, uh, we can't cope with. Uh, during EVA, there was no problem with the uh, water in the suit, yep. and it seems to be mostly of uh, occurring when the men are hooked up to the ship ECS rather than the backpack. Uh, the night was quiet. Both uh, spacecraft are performing well. There are no uh, anomalies other than those that have already been reported to discuss uh, uh, with either of the two spacecraft. Uh, we had some discussion uh, with the crew about uh, an element of the uh, side experiment that is uh, uh, one of the cath cold cathode uh, ion gauges having to do with measuring the atmospheric pressure on the moon. Uh, the problem with that is that the readings that we're getting in the control center uh, should be probably lower than they are and they should have gotten down there real quickly after a cover was blown loose. Uh, that did not occur. That is the oh, pressure is going down. Oh, I think it's down, loading aircraft or something. I don't to know. What you would think the ambient pressure at, on the moon is. Uh, and it's possible that the unit has tipped over with its uh, sensing instrument nose down in the ground. Uh, you recall that we added that, or you may have heard a little while ago that we added that to the Traverse plan, which I'll discuss in a minute. No pappy lights. But that's the reason for that being added. Uh, the commander woke up at about 1.29.06. Runway so looks a little bit dodgy, to, to be honest. Prior to the planned wake-up time. Uh, yeah, there's some weird green strips in the, the middle EBA of it. That's no good. Them before they went to sleep, uh, before uh, the sleep we'll take period, it. Uh, we'll if they take woke it. up and were ready to go, we would proceed with it. The commander gave us the estimate of the start time of about 1.30, 1.30, or 1.32, which we'll see about soon. We were able to verify during the night, by the way, as we reported to the commander this morning, uh, that the range radio indication was the side okay here. And, the, and the slightly off nominal readings they were getting during the descent yesterday when they were doing the paraloon checks were due to the slightly non-nominal orbits and the charts and the way in which that number is computed and uh, the instrument itself is working fine and will be fine for the rendezvous. Okay, uh, we'll take the next taxiway. On the taxi backpacks, way. by weighing the water, we were able to update the usage rates of both the water and, and uh, get a better handle on what we were using the oxygen for. In both cases, both the water and the oxygen, the uh, Backpacks were doing better than we predicted. Oh. It appears that the men are putting out less uh, work to do the same kind of task that we have outlined than we anticipated, and the, the BTU per hour is down by about 10 to 20 percent uh, compared to that that we predicted pre-flight. Uh, we expect that the workload for this next EVA will probably be down about 10 percent from what we predicted pre-flight. Also, based on our okay, with the first well, EVA I don't even see. Oh, there's a terminal. We expect to be in real Looks like a long trip the into the terminal. Uh, whether we would extend the EVA, it's, uh, we'll soon come up. Let me pause the audio. Uh, I'll probably pick it up after the press conference. That's not really the audio that I was looking to cover. But yeah, so here we are at Oslo, and next flight will be to Stockholm in an MD-82 with Scandinavian Airlines livery. Oh, I still got the air brakes out. All right, uh, we'll proceed, but thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.